thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Wilson Mazimba. I'm from Zambia and the Minister of Commerce, Trade and Industry, uh, where the National Trade Facilitation Committee Secretariat is domiciled. So I am representing the country and also the Secretariat. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of uh, uh, history. Mm -hmm. The committee was uh, established in 2016, January 2016, and uh, in September 2016, the Secretariat was also established. Uh, the committee is helping in implementing the TFA as um, an interactive platform because we have members uh, represented from various government, private, and um, the civil society onto that platform. So through that interaction, we are able to monitor, follow what is happening. So it's helping a lot in implementing the TFA. Well, the, the, the challenges to start with, uh, as identified in the plenary session, some of them involve the funding of the committee and the secretariat. Uh, funding currently is not adequate. And um, following up on that, the funding is mostly donor driven. Um, which is not very good, in my opinion, uh, should be funded by government, the main stakeholder. The opportunity is that um, the committee presents a very good uh, chance to coordinate all the implementing agencies in the country. And um, the committee should be able to supervise what is happening in the country and monitor progress. My name is Patricia Muela, I'm from Zambia, I'm actually from the Ministry of Commerce and Trade, specifically from the National Trade Facilitation Committee, uh, Secretariat of Zambia. Uh, we, like, uh, maybe initially I should say Zambia is a landlocked or is it landlinked country. We are completely surrounded by eight other countries. So because of that, we actually have a lot of transit traffic passing through, passing through Zambia, which of course makes our borders, two of them, one with Zimbabwe and one with DRC, are very high traffic borders with over 500 trucks per day. Uh, this, this in itself poses a, poses a challenge, but through the National Trade Facilitation Committee where all agencies are meeting, uh, such type of situations have been brought together and we have tried to find uh, solutions to, in terms of these specific trade facilitation problems. Some of the solutions which uh, the National Trade Facilitation Committee has actually settled have been uh, a situation where we had some delays, especially with those people passing through our borders with passenger vehicles. And uh, as a result of that, uh, and through the committee, we were able to develop a new procedure, which has actually resulted in a new uh, form, which we're calling the Integrated Border Declaration Form, which is actually coming into effect on the 1st of January. This form will bring together all the requirements of the various agencies with respect to people passing through our borders with passenger vehicles. So you would only you would fill this form with Zambia Revenue Authority, and through that you would be able to fulfill the requirements of all our other agencies at the border. So this was actually able to be achieved through the National Trade Facilitation Committee. We already do use tax revenues to fund various aspects of our, of our operations, even in Zambia. But I think you would have to look at it that the Trade Facilitation Agreement has brought in, into the picture peculiar circumstances and it is these other activities which we are trying to, to bring together which probably will make us require donor, uh, donor funding. Uh, with respect to, to the borders, for example, one of the issues we have to provide for uh, at the borders is probably be able to provide specific lanes for traffic, transit traffic, whatever. And this is not something we have, and this is something which requires infrastructure development. So for such type of activities, we definitely do need uh, donor support for that. But we already use our own revenues for all the other, for all the other issues. Which, which which we do. 
But as I said, when you look at the trade facilitation agreement, it has probably brought extra demand on us in us trying to fulfill our trade facilitation agenda. Uh, the meeting, I would like to say, has been very informative. Uh, we have learnt we have learnt a lot from other our other colleagues from other other committees. We've uh, we've learnt that okay, this is probably where we need to do better. But we've also been able to see where we have done better ourselves. So it has actually been very informative, though it has been a bit very packed. But it has been very informative. I am Edwin Stach uh, from Malawi. I work for the Malawi Revenue Authority. And uh, I'm here as, um, in fact, my organization uh, is currently the chair of the National Committee on Trade Facilitation. So I come in my capacity as uh, chair of uh, the uh, National Committee. But otherwise, back home uh, in my organization, I'm Deputy Commissioner responsible for uh, business analysis. Uh, basically, what um, my, my department does is to analyze the customer's business. Um, before and after um, um, importation. Basically, we, we, that's what we do. You may also appreciate that Malawi has um, uh, ratified the uh, trade facilitation agreement, mm -hmm. and um, we are a participating member in that regard. Um, in terms of the trade facilitation initiatives that are spelled out in the trade facilitation agreement, uh, that we have also adopted uh, in the local scenario. Um, the situation is in fact uh, promoting our customers' business in, so, in, in, in much as um, uh, revenue collection is concerned. In fact, it has simplified most of the um, 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 hiccups that uh, were there uh, earlier before implementation of the TFA. Um, it, in fact, this has also trickled down to our uh, stakeholders. Uh, the business community are now able to, uh, for example, in terms of payment for uh, taxes, uh, they are doing it electronically. In fact, they can pay from any point so long uh, they are able to uh, access internet. So to lodgement of declarations, uh, they can also do so from whatever point. But we are also able to facilitate um, pre-importations before the goods, uh, pre-arrival of, of our goods. We are able to uh, accept declarations being lodged uh, with the um, Malawi Revenue Authority and uh, the related taxes collected, which of course also enables us to collect revenues in advance. Right. So we have revenues ready before goods have arrived. So it, all in all, uh, the trade facilitation agreement has also facilitated um, uh, in terms of revenue collection, but also simplification of uh, customs procedures, which also our business uh, uh, st the stakeholders seem also to be appreciating. We, of course, in terms of the trade facilitation agreement, we have conducted two timely studies uh, where um, uh, we are able to measure uh, uh, the period taken between uh, importation and the uh, clearance of goods. That has also uh, reduced very much. And so too the documentation that used to be uh, um, uh, used in terms of clearance of goods, that has reduced very much from quite a number of documents, from maybe 20, 30 documents, to only now five or six, which are mandatory. So that has also uh, speeded up uh, release times and uh, facilitated quick release of uh, goods into the economy. And the economy has also benefited because at the end of the day, the final consumer uh, is also able to access goods that um, are cheaper, that have uh, landed uh, cheaply. So in all in all, it's beneficial uh, to the whole economy of Malawi. As I mentioned earlier on, um, Malawi um, ratified um, the, the trade facilitation agreement. And, um, and because of the same, we, in fact, we, um, as a country, we, we, we have, um, oh, at that level, we have set up the, what we call, is called the National um, Customs Trade Facilitation Committee which, um, um, in fact, is, is composed of both private and public. And this committee um, is there basically to uh, ensure facilitate, uh, trade is facilitated, and at the same time, 
um, um, uh, the public and private se sectors are able to understand and appreciate what is entailed in the uh, trade facility agreement. In so doing, we have uh, a common understanding, uh, so much so that um, when we discuss about trade facilitation, we have um, 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 we are on the same page. But other than that, uh, in terms of, for example, my revenue authority, we have ad 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 adapted and also adopted uh, issues like, for example, uh, authorized economic operators, where we have identified a few. Uh, currently, we are piloting with about 10 um, importers uh, who are being accorded uh, simplified sort of um, uh, controls in terms of customs procedures. Uh, and basically, we just want to see how best we can adopt, adopt and adapt the authorized economic uh, scheme uh, to the local uh, situation. But other than that, we have also uh, looked at, uh, for example, risk management issues, post scarce audit, um, and quite a number of uh, initiatives that are contained in the uh, 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 trade facilitation agreement. Malawi is an uh, agrarian. Uh, basically, we, 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 our economy is based on agriculture, so mostly we would be exporting agricultural products. Yeah, but in turn, we, uh, because the uh, production base capacity is very small, so we import most of our raw materials that are used in manufacturing, but also we would also be importing our finished products where we can manufacture uh, 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 a similar type of goods. Yeah, so basically we are uh, agri-based economy uh, and we would also be exporting most of our uh, goods uh, that are uh, agri-based. So in terms of exports, for example, yes. um, here we're talking about, earlier on we were talking about importations, mm -hmm. where we're able to collect uh, taxes, tax, set taxes quickly. But in terms of exports also, um, uh, they are um, because the time taken to clear process clearance and whatever is uh, reduced, wherever the, the exports go, uh, they will be uh, competitive because the landed cost will be cheaper because the, uh, most of the uh, controls that were earlier on, uh, were, which were um, um, uh, sort of expensive as contributing to the uh, final uh, cost of the products, when they land at the international market, because these have been, have been reduced, um, uh, they will be uh, able to compete from, with similar goods from other countries. Exactly. So, yes, um, we, 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 we really uh, think the TFA uh, is beneficial to Malawi. There are a lot of benefits, and because there is a lot that we are, of, of course, um, as Malawi, we are, we are gaining from uh, the discussions that are taking place at the moment. Um, for example, uh, the st sustainability of our uh, national committees, we have uh, in fact learned from other uh, uh, presenters um, that we, we really need to do more. We really need to have a legal basis to have these national committees so that they are recognized at, 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 at that level. So that if possible, maybe governments could also be funding such committees for their sustainability. But uh, the need also to have political will uh, from the highest level, well, that is very, also very important. Um, in so doing, uh, that will enable the national committees um, to be recognizable uh, in, the, in the first place, but they also have the support from the highest mm. uh, level, in which, um, um, which would, of course, uh, enable implementation of the TFA uh, at the domestic level um, uh, to be smooth. So there is quite a lot that we are uh, learning, but also from the interactions that we are, are getting uh, bilaterally between Malawi and uh, the other countries, in fact, which had hitherto not been possible if we did not have this um, uh, forum. Yeah, so we are able to uh, share ideas and see how best we can position ourselves in terms of uh, trade facilitation yeah, um, as a country, regionally, but also at a continent level. Thank you for the opportunity. Firstly, uh, my name is Clarence Freeman. I work for the National Trade Facilitation Committee from the Ministry of Commerce and Industry of Liberia on the Secretariat. Um, my work, obviously, is to help coordinate the activities, make some follow-ups where decisions are taken on the committee 
and raise, helping raising awareness about the benefits of trade facilitation. Firstly, um, Liberia is a country that have come years of civil war, and that tells one that there are a lot of infrastructure that were damaged during the years of war, not to mention the ports. Uh, we have about four different ports, but currently it's only one that is really operational in terms of international trade. The other three, they are more limited to a small scale uh, operation in terms of uh, import or export. So that tells one that is really a need to develop our trade-related infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That's a major challenge. Besides the infrastructure, then you come to coordination among government ministries and agencies involved in trade facilitation. Every ministry has a legitimate or a statutory mandate. And at some points, one could see the other as you solving their function not maybe realizing that the benefit of having a coordinated approach is best for the country and not an individual business. So these are issues that I think the trade facilitation agreement of the WTO can help us in addressing. In addition to that, you'll be looking at the number of documents required to import and export. Obviously, a businessman will not want to waste much time because time is money. The committee can be a right instrument solving these problems. Um, as it stands, we've been operating, but not really at a large scale. Mm -hmm. uh, you will be aware that we've had a change of, gov of administration in the government. We had elections, and the previous administration was replaced. So a number of officials were changed. And so this year, it has been a challenging one, but over time, at the technical level, we've done a number of awareness among major stakeholders, private and public. Even in this gathering, we managed to have the president of the Chamber of Commerce. He's also attending this uh, uh, forum. Because of our engagement with him, he's also a newly elected president of the Chamber of Commerce. So that tells you that he really needs to be aware of these things and how they benefit the private sector. So the committee role can be very helpful in addressing this issue. And having an inclusive representation, that is, it's not one-sided, all government institutions on the committee, is very important. Because if the private sector is represented and their voice is heard, and decisions emanating from the committee is implemented by the regulatory authority, it gives them that confidence that it is good that we be part of this process and that we contribute and be involved fully. So it's a good... Uh, um, um, uh, mechanism for addressing trade facilitation issues. The meeting has been very interesting. Um, obviously, you meet a lot of people from cross spectrum, whether development partners or other colleagues from other uh, countries in Africa. That's interesting. And besides the, the sections, there are side events that are going on, also enhancing the, the, the benefit of attending this meeting and he has been very helpful. Even at one point, even a chamber president, he have exposed him to a lot of you know, organizations and institutions. He said, wow, that's good. I think I can meet with this one, I can meet with that one. And he's really, really appreciative of it. And it's really been helpful because you kind of learn from others. Um, in Africa, you have many least developed countries with similar characteristics. So, Listening to others, their experiences, where they've achieved, what the challenges are, is very helpful. Because if you and I share something in common, mm -hmm. we can better discuss. Mm -hmm. And over time, I can learn from what you've done best, what you've mastered over time, and what can I learn from what you've mastered. And that's where I think this forum is really helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Brilliant. Thank you. My name is Joseph Akwaga. I'm coming from Ghana. And uh, I am representing the private sector and a member of the National Trade Facilitation Committee of Ghana. Private sector in our affairs, uh, we have the Chamber of Commerce, we have the freight forwarders. I'm actually from the freight forwarding uh, flock, uh, being the immediate past president of the Ghana Institute of Freight Forwarders. And that is how I, I got in and 
has to represent the private sector because once trade is concerned, we are the intermediate people that lays between the trading world and governments yes. and regulatory services. The freight forwarding and, uh, front need to understand what the trade facilitation actually is about. And when they get that basic understanding, because we lays between the government and the trading public, we are in a unique position in order to educate the trading public than even the, uh, the government going out there to educate. Because we must understand the issues first. And once we understand the issues, we will be able to even one-on-one -on -one educate our individual clients. And even when we put them together, we will be, able, we will be in the best position to explain the issues about the trade facilitation, uh, trade facilitation in general, because trade facilitation in general is about the private sector, the trading community. Uh, the trade facilitation, not necessarily, but once trade facilitation is a concept in how to simplify the customs procedures and the rules and the regulations that governs the import export and transit of goods, the forwarder or the custom broker need to understand the, the, the rule of the game or the rudiments that you must go through because we are at the for, forefront. We need to pick the goods or we need to arrange the pickup of goods from point A to point B. A while ago, the vice president of Ghana, uh, added his voice to stop using paper, even though we have already entered in the, into the electronic era of clearance, but we're still continuing with producing paper. So a while ago, the vice president of the, of the country said, no, the system that we are using is electronic. So why can't you do away with paper? Because the same information that you need is already sitting on the electronic platform. So let's do away with paper. So some progress has been made. Coming here is just uh, an additional uh, knowledge that I have come to gain through the sharing of other countries' experiences, which uh, is good for me, so that when I go back, I will go and share the knowledge that I have come to uh, take from here. Other countries uh, have learned from Ghana's experience because we were the first to go electronic. Uh, about 18 years back, yeah. we went electronic by, by, going, by using the Mauritius uh, model, uh -huh. which uh, supported by the Ghana Community Network. Mm -hmm. That became the platform which we do customs transactions. Mm -hmm. And as time goes on, all other regulatory agencies has to uh, join in until again when Ghana has to do away with the destination inspections and to do uh, classification and valuation by customs itself in September 2015 which brings uh, um, another model known as the pre-arrival processing uh -huh. system pass where now customs has to do the classification and valuation internally. It is no more a third party. We started from the ECOWAS level. Sure. And the same thing replicated at the SADC, EAC, and all those things. And now to bring the whole Africa together in order that we should be able to trade among ourselves. Mm -hmm. So when we are able to trade among ourselves, we will keep the little uh, uh, funds that we have here to develop our place, I think that is in a good direction. 
So my name is Philip Isler. I'm the director of the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation, sitting at the World Economic Forum in Geneva, Switzerland. Well, I mean, the TFA is, 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 is a critical um, step forward within the framework of trade facilitation. And you know, a lot of stats have been, have, have been pronounced in relation to the impact that the trade facilitation and the TFA in particular can bring to the world. Um, and so what's important now is to find a way of implementing this agreement in the best possible conditions. Well, you know, we're nearly two years in now um, from the coming into force of the TFA. And I think there are a lot of initiatives which have been kick-started in a number of countries around the world. There are a number of organizations and initiatives working in a coordinated way. So as far as that's concerned, I think things are moving quite well. Um, what we do notice, and it's becoming very clear at this conference, is that there is still a lot of work to be done. And um, we need to now accelerate the process um, so that we reach our targets. Well, on one hand, you know, there is the whole area of ratification of the TFA, and uh, there is some work that still needs to be done on the African continent as far as that's concerned. Um, in terms of practical approach to trade facilitation, we all know there are still a lot of challenges out there, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's organization of the various stakeholders involved in the supply chain. The uh, collaboration between the public and the private sector which in many areas still needs to be improved. So there are a number of areas which have to be progressed in parallel. Mm -hmm. The gains uh, can, be, can be massive, um, you know, especially from an export perspective. How do you build um, um, more um, business and industry in, in, in Africa? How do you boost this into the world supply chains? Um, and how do, how do you generate um, an environment which is conducive to the development of um, small and medium enterprises? The difficulty with small and medium enterprises is that they, they have to evolve in a challenging environment and they don't necessarily have the bandwidth and the resources to be able to tackle this. Um, and so they are somehow victims of this difficult environment mm -hmm. and somehow they need to be helped um, in order to overcome these challenges because by themselves they will find it very difficult and by, by definition um, you know um, entrepreneurs on the continent have got enough challenges building their business it's unfair to have to ask them to also try and tackle the trade facilitation aspects so they need help as far as that's concerned. So the Global Alliance was an initiative that was established three years ago. And it was on the back of the successful negotiation of the TFA. And there was general recognition that one of the success factors of the TFA was the um, high involvement of private sector. In the end, private sector are the entity stakeholder in the supply chain that know where the issues are better than anybody else because they face these issues every day. And so um, the donor community thought it might be a good idea to establish a mechanism, an initiative, which is working with, very closely with the private sector to tackle the implementation of the TFA. And so how did, that is how the Global Alliance was formed. It is uh, financed by six donors, the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, Germany, Australia, and Denmark, which joined us only a few months ago. And on the other hand, we're working with initially large private sector companies which have a global reach and have got the resources to be able to help us implement uh, trade facilitation projects. And all together, we are embarking on this, um, on this adventure, shall we say. Um, we have a secretariat which itself is um, a consortium formed by the World Economic Forum, the International Chamber of Commerce, the Center for International Enterprise, and GIZ. So the NTFC is one of the components of the TFA. Um, and countries are you know, um, expected to implement these NTFCs. Now, what we see is that the development of these NTFCs is uh, varied in different parts of the world, from well-established, uh, well-directed um, uh, initiatives to embryonic initiatives which still need direction and, 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 and proper governance. And so the 
the establishment or the, the, the establishment of this of this conference is really timely because what we're finding now we're starting to see the first results in terms of what is working well and what isn't working not so well. Um, to the question as to why is the Global Alliance associated to this uh, event is because we have found that a lot of our projects are actually reliant on well-functioning NTFCs. Mm -hmm. And that also means that if the NTFCs are not working well, then it's going to be potentially a hindrance to our projects moving forward. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important that we are able to progress the NTFC agenda so that the trade facilitation agreement can be implemented in the best possible conditions. The Poland is really about trying to get a picture in terms of who is doing what and who is being more successful than others. And then being able to share ideas and experiences. And I think this is a really good first step to do just that. Um, and then get the views from the different stakeholders, whether these are, they are the donors, the implementing agencies, the international organizations, and try and find a way to all get on the same wavelength in terms of how we're going to go about um, achieving what are, you know, what are big challenges. And so I think this, this, this conference is, is a great first step towards this and hopefully we can now you know, move this discussion along, assess how much progress we are making and in an ideal world try to adjust the course um, as we get, as a group, as a large group, more experienced in terms of implementing these NTFCs. My name is Paul Fekete. I'm a Senior International Trade Advisor for the U.S. Agency for International Development, and I am based in Washington at USAID's headquarters. So USAID has been involved in trade facilitation even before the uh, trade facilitation agreement was concluded in, 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 at the WTO. Uh, we've worked uh, on uh, trade facilitation reforms uh, throughout the African continent and around the world uh, through our 94 or so missions uh, that we have. Um, trade facilitation, we believe, is a, a, a real key to uh, promoting trade and economic growth, and so it's why we have, in fact, dedicated a lot of resources to that issue. Uh, we have a variety of programs, uh, both that we implement uh, on our own, as well as supporting the work that is being undertaken by other international organizations, uh, such as the ITC, the UNCTAD uh, effort, uh, uh, the World Bank's efforts through the Trade Facilitation Support Program, and so on. I see. I see. And, and, and why is this important for USA to, to support this kind of work? Well, like I say, uh, trade facilitation is uh, one of the means by which to uh, promote uh, trade flows, uh, imports and exports. Uh, it has a direct linkage to, uh, uh, to economic growth, uh, and economic growth ultimately is, uh, is one of the ways in which we uh, uh, promote countries' economic development and poverty reduction. So uh, those are issues that are all linked together and are obviously key to USAID's mission around the world. USAID is uh, uh, primarily focusing on uh, technical assistance, uh, capacity building. Um, infrastructure issues are probably not our strength. Uh, there are other uh, U.S. government entities that are actively uh, or more actively focused on, on, on infrastructure issues. Uh, we have worked uh, in, uh, in, in many countries uh, with uh, national governments as well as with the private sector to raise awareness about uh, the importance of trade facilitation and then to work with customs authorities and other border agencies to help them both understand the obligations of the trade facilitation agreement and to move forward with its implementation. Among developing countries, uh, the needs are in, in, in many ways uh, similar in nature. Uh, there are many uh, sort of inefficiencies, if you will, that uh, prevent uh, goods from moving uh, efficiently across borders. Uh, we are strong believers uh, of, the, uh, of the need to integrate countries into uh, international value chains. Uh, but that means not only promoting exports, but also promoting in imports, because imports serve as inputs to uh, productive capacity of countries around the world. So it really encompasses all of those various elements. In Africa specifically, I think uh, you know the opportunities are significant in Africa because uh, uh, probably Africa suffers from some of the highest costs uh, uh, to trade. And so for the private sector in particular, uh, any way that uh, we can improve efficiency, uh, any ways we can reduce the costs to the trading community uh, will have direct uh, 
knock-on benefits, if you will, uh, for the level of trade that takes place. We have been working to support national trade facilitation committees uh, around the continent as well as around the world. Uh, these committees are crucial to the implementation of the agreement because they are really intended to be the primary interlocutors between the donor community and the national governments. So we really want to make sure that we do what we can to strengthen, to encourage governments to uh, develop, uh, you know, and power, if you will, uh, their national trade facilitation committees so that, so that they can serve as the mechanism by which countries prioritize and develop their short, medium, and long-term strategies for uh, TFA implementation. Uh, the reason I'm here in Addis is because this is a great opportunity to uh, meet with uh, most of the countries on the continent in one place and uh, to really uh, serve to promote uh, our belief that uh, national trade facilitation committees are uh, should be the number one priority as uh, countries move towards the TFA's implementation. We've had some interactions with a lot of the, 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 the delegates uh, from a variety of countries. Uh, USAID has a number of efforts uh, at the bilateral level, at the regional level, and we also work through a public-private partnership called the Global uh, Alliance for Trade Facilitation, uh, which is also implementing programs on behalf of not only the U.S. government, but on behalf of five other donors. Mm -hmm. And so we have been interacting with some of the uh, governmental counterparts uh, to, again, encourage them and to uh, you know, uh, make sure that uh, we are working in a collaborative fashion towards the objectives of the agreement. Alors, euh, je suis Saïd Mohamed Hassani, euh, je représente euh, le Maroc dans ce forum. Je suis directeur de la défense et de la réglementation commerciale au niveau du, du ministère euh, chargé du, du commerce. Par cette fonction, je suis responsable de la, du comité national de la facilitation du commerce au niveau euh, du Maroc. Donc, euh, je dirais que le Maroc euh, n'a pas vraiment attendu l'accord de l'OMC pour entamer les réformes en matière de facilitation. Nous avons une, grand, une longue histoire en matière de facilitation. Nous avons commencé depuis notre adhésion au GATT en 1987. Et le Maroc, c'est le berceau de l'OMC. L'accord a été signé à Marrakech en, en 80, mars, avril 1994. Donc euh, nous, nous avons entamé plusieurs étapes dans la, 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 la facilitation la, du, du commerce à travers d'abord euh, au moment où il y avait les documents, c'était l'harmonisation, la rationalisation des, des documents du commerce extérieur. Nous avons donc pris les, les, les modèles qui ont été établis par le CFACTONU à l'époque et nous les avons intégrés dans notre euh, les réglementation nationale tout ce qui est documentation et après le développement de, 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 de la facilitation euh, nous, nous avons établi donc un, un plan d'action euh, en matière de facilitation en, en 2006 ce plan d'action euh, partait d'un diagnostic très approfondi de toutes les procédures et nous avons établi une large cartographie de toutes les procédures que nous, nous, nous appliquons dans le port, dans les aéroports et dans tous les, 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 les points d'entrée de, et de sortie des marchandises au niveau douanier, au niveau des, des différentes structures de contrôle également sanitaire, contrôle des normes et, et également les, là où il y a des, 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 des licences d'importation ou des, des réglementations qui géraient l'import ou l'export. Donc toutes ces procédures ont été mises sur la table pour nous pouvoir euh, identifier là où il y a les goulots euh, d'étranglement, là où il y a les, 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 les retards. Donc le plan d'action a été établi sur cette base-là, sur cette analyse très approfondie. Ce plan d'action se base d'une manière générale sur d'abord la facilitation à travers la dématérialisation et également la facilitation à travers la suppression de certaines procédures ou la suppression de certains documents. C'est ce que nous avions fait à un certain moment. Et puis, lorsque des procédures sont nécessaires, on essaie de les dématérialiser. Nous avons pour cela développé le concept de « single window » qui a permis donc de, 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 de passer à l'étape de la dématérialisation. Ça a commencé par un petit « single window » au niveau portuaire, puis ça a été élargi à d'autres activités liées au commerce extérieur. Notre ambition, donc, c'est d'aller vers un, un, un 
commerce extérieur à zéro papier en 2021 avec une, une insertion dans notre single window de toutes les, les procédures de la chaîne logistique et cela euh, donc euh, comme euh, se fondant toujours sur les recommandations du, du CEFACT ONU qui a donc, émis beaucoup de, de, de documents concernant le fonctionnement des single windows. Okay. Voilà. My name is Esther Legue. I'm from Nigeria and I am the vice chair of the UN CEFACT Bureau. Here, uh, because of that topic on the table uh -huh. and um, from the UNEC, UNC fact perspective, we are glad that this forum is discussing that issue. It is time that we actually address that issue if we want to facilitate trade and improve the economies of especially the developing countries. Um, women have a lot to contribute towards economic growth of any nation. And especially for this forum, which is the African Forum, the African countries are really going to benefit so much if attention is given to women in all aspects. And like I said in my presentation, I looked at it from different dimensions. And from whichever dimension you look at it, women are disadvantaged. And at this forum, we are emphasizing that attention should be given to all those aspects that we have mentioned that are challenges so that the economic um, development of these countries can be improved upon. My name is uh, Ali Meloga from Nigeria. Uh, I work with the Nigerian Customs Service, also a member of the National Trade Facilitation Committee. We have so many stakeholders uh, in the quality. We have the quality has been chaired by the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Investment. Then we have members from the Nigerian Ports Authority, Standards Organization, uh, National Agency for Foods, Drugs and Administration Control, uh, members from the Chambers of Commerce, then the Shippers Council, and a lot more of stakeholders. These are just a few I mentioned. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, um, what, in, in Nigeria, what, uh, about, what problems have there been with uh, trade in the past? Uh, why do we need trade facilitation in, in Nigeria? Uh, we need trade facilitation in Nigeria in order to, you know, anchor with the international best practice mm -hmm. and uh, to reduce cost of doing business because the more you reduce cost in business the cheaper the consumer gets the product so these are one of the issues that uh, need to be addressed under the trade facilitation and then a lot of bottlenecks and manual process product processes are being reduced based on recommendations of the quality so that all these bottlenecks and delays in doing businesses can be reduced. Uh, like in the Nigerian Customs uh, Service, it so happens that we even achieve six hours clearance of cargo in the port against the 48 hours target uh, set by the government. But you know, uh, this, 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 Speed in clearance applies only to legitimate trades. Sure. Yeah, because sometimes you discover that it is a non compliant environment. We have a lot of challenges between carriers, you know, the, the, the trade community as well. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the challenges we have. So all these need to be addressed before you can enjoy the seamless. Trade facilitation. The meeting is really good because we share experiences uh, both by the side and at the table, and this will, you know, make us improve a lot of our processes and procedures in order to facilitate uh, trade up back home. And 
it has given us a lot of insight on the international best practices, like all these programs of One Stop Border Point and the rest. So I feel it is, is very, very important and it is going to be useful in facilitating trade. And we need more of these forums so that everybody, the larger community in the, in the continent, can now realize and understand the essence of this program. And secondly, I would also like to recommend similar forums at the top level. Because in most cases, the challenges we have in implementing some of these uh, agreements is lack of the political will. Because the top level management had to understand and accept the concepts of all these uh, trade facilitation measures so that it will be easy for the lower and middle management level to implement it because they are the people who implement it. So the strategic level has to understand and appreciate what it is all about before you come down to the My name is uh, Brenda Mundia. I'm the Deputy Director for Capacity Building at the World Customs Organization. So obviously I'm representing the World Customs Organization here. I'm leading the delegation from my institution. There are quite a number of challenges that uh, we see uh, with regard to the trade facilitation agenda in Africa. Uh, first and foremost, it's about the, the disjoint between the policy makers and the implementers. Customs is on the implementation side. So when they go to negotiate these trade agreements, Customs is left behind. But Customs is expected to implement the outcome of these uh, measures. And this is how come you see sometimes it becomes challenging to realize the benefits of these uh, you know, trade facilitation agreements. Um, other than that, we have some um, institutional challenges which require to be addressed. This is about building uh, both institutional capacity and individual capacity. For institutional capacity, we are looking at just the processes. We are looking at also other material resources that uh, should uh, support the facilitation agenda. And for the individual capacity, we are looking at, at skills, especially in the area of customs. We are looking, when we talk about, uh, you know, ensuring um, that we're facilitating trade, we are looking at a situation where the cross-border traders spend as little time as possible at the border. So the staff need to be at least skilled in uh, you know, techniques, post-importation techniques that allows compliant traders, like you know, the authorized economic operators, to quickly pass through the border, and then customs can come in post-importation to focus on post-clearance audits. So we need to build uh, capacity in um, those areas. But also on just uh, you know, transaction processing, Customs needs to build uh, competences in risk management so that interventions are well targeted. You focus on risk areas and ensure the compliant you know, uh, traders are really facilitated. So that is an area that also requires um, addressing. Yeah. At um, institutional level, when you talk about processes, we have very cumbersome uh, processes. For instance, at the border, you may find a lot of government agencies all with a mandate to intervene in the clearance of goods, and that causes delays. So there is need for employing concepts such as coordinated border management, where these uh, government agencies work together to ensure that they minimize interventions. And by minimizing, I'm not saying they give a leeway even for illegal goods to come through, but they minimize in a sense that they work together. They can do joint inspections, they can, they can have uh, even some integrated risk management where their in, in interventions are really informed by you know, the risks that they have uh, identified collectively. Yeah. Sometimes there can even be delegation of authority so that some government agencies are all not in the forefront, but they delegate to, say, customs to do the preliminary checks. And if there's a problem, they can be able to refer it to the agency with competency in that particular area. So those are some of the few challenges that I not, <laughs> yeah, th which really need to be addressed uh, in um, Africa. My name is uh, Melvin Spray. I'm the head of the Standards and Trade Development Facility, the STDF. Uh, this is a global partnership. <clears throat> it's housed by the WTO, and it also involves the Food and Agriculture Organization, 
uh, the World Bank, the World Health Organization, and the World Organization for, for Animal Health, and we work really on facilitating safe trade. So essentially what is very important for countries, and especially I would say countries in Africa, is to reduce uh, trade costs, um, and that enhances the competitiveness of countries. So we work specifically in the area of reducing uh, trade costs in the trade of food and agriculture products, but at the same time what we would like is to improve uh, health protection. And that's important uh, for many uh, African countries and in specifically, I would say, small me and medium uh, enterprises where the costs of trading in food and agricultural costs, the SPS, the sanitary and phytosanitary related trade costs, are fixed costs. Mm -hmm. So this will help small medium enterprises and will, ho will also help, I would say, uh, female uh, traders. What we have observed uh, now that in many countries in Africa already uh, there are uh, uh, good examples of um, uh, of countries that uh, integrate uh, the SPS agencies uh, within, uh, let's say, the National Trade Facilitation Committees um, and also uh, look at integrating the SPS uh, agencies into their uh, single uh, window uh, systems. Uh, so you have examples like uh, Kenya, uh, Rwanda is doing this, um, Zambia, Senegal, uh, South Africa. So there are many good examples. And I think what is important that we identify more uh, of these examples, we collect those examples, we document them, and we yeah, essentially we disseminate them further. Uh, so that they can provide an inspiration for others. So my name is Joy Kategekwa. Uh, I'm from UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. I head the regional office for Africa, and so I'm here in this context. We have hosted the team, so to speak, for this important meeting. Well, UNCTAD prioritizes very much its work on trade facilitation because it's the critical nexus between opportunities and utilization in the sense that once you unlock uh, the customs procedures, once you streamline the processes of documentation around cross-border trade, once you have clarity on what rules and regulations will govern cross-border trade, then you've made it that much easier for trade to play its role in development. And so trade facilitation is critical in terms of the rules framework that members have agreed, not only at the WTO, but more recently in the context of the African continental free trade area, to oil the machinery of cross-border trade. And so UNCTAD has supported Africa in several ways uh, over the years. Uh, UNCTAD was very much behind supporting African nations in the WTO negotiations to have a development focus to the outcome. UNCTAD has also been supporting developing countries, African countries, in setting up the important infrastructure that will promote cross-border trade. You would be familiar with the ASICUDA, the Automated System of Customs Data uh, Management, which has been critical in digitalizing and making more efficient from a governance perspective and a competence perspective, efficiency perspective, cross-border trade. And recently, UNCTAD had also been behind with partners supporting the establishment of national trade facilitation committees across various countries, but also at regional level in various African economic regional economic communities and so our role has really been to prepare African nations to better utilize the opportunities presented in trade agreements by working and increasing the momentum on trade facilitation reforms. Open markets are only useful if they can be utilized so that's one angle to it and I think Dr. Kitui is the point that he made was really this question that Africa must prepare itself to utilize the opportunities created in trade agreements both at the WTO and in the CFTA in order to do that trade facilitation plays a central role because it unlocks the bottlenecks within the chain of cross-border trade. There's another important point that he made which is critical, which is that Africa must focus on preparing itself from the dimension of productive capacities to utilize the opportunities created through trade facilitation, which means that there must be a parallel focus on infrastructure, as you said. There must be a parallel focus on manufacturing, on creating connectivity within the continent, so that when trade facilitation does what it does, which is streamline the processes, you do have the goods to cross the borders. Hi, I'm Philip Parham. I am the British government's envoy to the Commonwealth. And I'm here today taking part in the National Trade Facilitation Committee Forum, uh, which is the first such forum to be held in Africa. Yes. So uh, the Commonwealth held a heads of government meeting in London uh, in April. Uh, that was attended by 46 heads of government, 49 foreign ministers, and all 53 members of the Commonwealth were represented there. And they adopted a very bold and ambitious program of activity to make the Commonwealth, and indeed the wider international community, 
uh, more secure, more prosperous, more fair, and more sustainable. And under the heading of uh, making the Commonwealth and the wider international community more prosperous, uh, one of the things that the British government is doing is to um, uh, renew and extend its program of activity, specifically activity conducted by Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, with UNCTAD and with the World Customs Organization to help uh, countries implement the Trade Facilitation Agreement. And the implement implementation of that agreement is uh, widely acknowledged to be one important way in which uh, global trade can be increased, global co prosperity can be enhanced, and uh, uh, social progress more generally can be made. Well, HMRC is working with uh, UNCTAD and WCO as delivery partners to uh, build the capacity of uh, a number of countries, and in the context of the meeting today, specifically a number of countries in Africa, uh, build their capacity to implement the, uh, the trade facilitation agreement, uh, and that includes the function of national uh, trade facilitation committees, which are one of the key ways to try to uh, ensure that uh, countries account for the way in which they are implementing the agreement. Just in the, in the day that I've been here, uh, it's been very useful. I mean, for me, as a non-expert in this field, uh, it's already taught me a great deal, uh, and uh, I'm enormously grateful to UNCTAD and to WCO for the opportunity. And um, it's, a, it's a great gathering of both uh, delivery partners, such as UNCTAD and WCO uh, and the World Bank and others, uh, and development partners such as ourselves, uh, and also uh, recipients of this support and assistance. Um, and, and I've seen in the short time I've been here how important it is and how valuable it is to get together uh, that mixture. Okay. And it may be worth also saying that um, the the south-south uh, collaboration element of this overall effort is very much uh, in evidence here today. And I've just left a meeting where that process of uh, knowledge sharing between those who are going through the process of building their capacity to implement the agreement uh, is clearly something that's very useful and valuable to them. My name is Mark Henderson. Uh, I'm representing the World Trade Organization TFA facility. Well, um, I think this event and focusing on the National Trade Facilitation Committees is particularly valuable uh, as we are working with members, WTO members, to support them to implement the agreement. We're finding uh, as, as we expected, that that, that committee is a, a pivotal element of bringing the, the provisions through to, to implementation. Um, there are elements of the agreement that touch on different agencies at the border, uh, and to bring those together and to kind of reach a consensus and streamline decision making, a committee is essential to that. So I can really see the value of the discussions that we've been having here. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging topic to be able to bring different agencies with different mandates and uh, who report to, to different elements within their, their government and outside of government together. Um, but I think everybody appears to have kind of bought into the case uh, that they, they need to be working together uh, for the reasons, you know, for the reasons that we give. What I do think that, that's interesting is that this uh, NTFC, the National Trade Facilitation Committees, is actually challenging for, for all WTO members, no matter their, their economic status. Um, but of course, it's a, it's a challenge that when you can bring money to bear on it, uh, makes the challenge more surmountable. Therefore, the, the least developed countries uh, with, with fewer economic resources do face a, a bigger challenge. Um, if all countries lack capacity, uh, you know, capacity building and training costs money, um, and and therefore there, there are members that need more support on that, and that's one of the things that we're trying to provide. Um, <clears throat> I mean, first of all, with the with the, the meeting, like I say, I mean, it, again, another interesting facet is that while the agreement requires members to coordinate their agencies uh, domestically to implement the agreement, 
It's also beholden on us as international organizations who have different responsibilities for the agencies in question to similarly coordinate ourselves. And I think uh, because we reflect the things that I mentioned earlier in, in terms of reporting to different hierarchies, having different mandates, it's similarly a challenge for us. Um, but I'm impressed by the, the cooperation that's taken place. We should say a special thanks to the ANTAC colleagues who've organized the event. Uh, they, they've put in a, a great deal of effort to, to coordinate it. Um, but yeah, together we are trying on our side to make the necessary efforts that, that reflect the efforts that need to be made domestically. Um, the question of whether we need more meetings like this, yeah, I'm afraid it's the same question you get from academia, you know, more, more research necessary. Um, by no means have we reached the end of the, the end of the road. I mean, committee structures are, are difficult, they need to be established but then maintained uh, and I think until we reach full implementation, the, the vehicle of the, of the committee structure through which so much progress needs to be driven uh, will, will need to be revisited, reinforced uh, and, and supported throughout that process. Mm -hmm.